should the NFL play in a bubble? Right? As we know, the major sports leagues, you have the NHL and the NBA, are doing a hub city system, at least for the NHL, and a bubble for the NBA. Well, MLB is without a bubble, and now the NFL, so far, at least plans on not having a bubble for the 2020 season. As we see the NBA, again, another spotless week of coronavirus tests. The bubble is working so far, three weeks in, so far, so good. Excuse me. Hockey, same thing, so far, so good. MLB, as we've seen, the results are not great, not promising. A few bumps in the road, if you want to call a massive outbreak for one team and another outbreak developing on the Cardinals, not promising or a bump in the road, as Major League Baseball will call it. But they are pushing on. They are continuing. And I'm curious, now that kind of MLB is underway, again, two weeks in, you see we've gotten at least the gist of what to expect now when you're trying to play sports in a pandemic without a bubble. Should the NFL try to play in a bubble? Would it be wise for them? Is that the only way that they can get their season off and, more importantly, finish their season? Or can they do it? Can they adopt what MLB is doing and basically try to play without a bubble? And for me, I think there's a few reasons why major, uh, excuse me, NFL can get away with not playing in a bubble this year. I think they are absolutely able to follow the same Major League Baseball route, try to contain the, the players when they're at practice, try to contain the virus as much as possible, at least keep their players safe, but they could do so without a bubble. First reason why, I mean, you look at just a pure NFL schedule, less travel. And as we've seen so far through Major League Baseball, Less travel in the NFL means less temptation for players. Think about it. For the NFL, if you have a road game, you're only traveling one day a week. You're going to the game Saturday night. You'll stay in a hotel. Sunday, you have the game, and you travel back on Sunday. Major League Baseball, obviously, it's a lot harder. You know, you're on road trips for seven days, maybe even ten days. You're on the road for a while. And as we know, especially when you're on the road, there's not much to do outside of your hotel room. So the players want to go out. They want to get it by teeth. They maybe want to, you know, dabble in the lifestyle. It's a lot, it's a lot more tempting to go out and try to do something to occupy your time on the road than it is at home. At least with the, you know, with the NFL, when you're on the road, that's the one night. Everyone on Saturday night is getting ready for the game. You're having meetings, you're game planning. MLB, you know, you have the game, and then kind of, you know, you're on your own. There's no real game planning every night. It's less intense. So, you know, you can wake up, do what you want, get a coffee, go walk around, mill around, and, you know, you don't have to be at the ballpark until 2 or 3 in the afternoon. There's a lot more dead time for Major League Baseball, which means there's a lot more temptation for the players to go out to maybe go into an environment they're not supposed to, as you saw with the Marlins, and now as you're seeing with the Cardinals, the temptation's there, and when they don't abide by the rules, when they try to push it, you can see what happens. So this with the NFL, you're only in a hotel once a week for half the season. You're only traveling, think about eight times, which is the, basically the equivalent of one road trip for Major League Baseball. And the rest of the week, you're practicing and you're at home, which allows for the coaches, you know, to basically keep a better eye on their players. And theoretically, when you're at home, when you're in your own home, there's more distractions to keep you at home than you are if you're on the road in a hotel room. So less travel in the NFL, less temptation, Number two, I mean, the NFL has the benefit of time. They've had the benefit of time since this entire pandemic started, right? Obviously, you had right in the middle of the seasons or towards the end of the seasons for NHL and NBA, they had to stop right away. Major League, Major League Baseball was trying to get ramped up day to start. The NFL was really the only league, for the most part, that was unaffected. The free agency period took a little hit because you couldn't make visits, but for the most part, there's a lot of Zoom meetings. You didn't have to go anywhere in order to try to sign and talk with a free agent. Draft was the same thing. They did the draft virtually. worked out great. And now you get the benefit of time because you see, by the time the NFL will kick off in early September, you will have already a mo- at least a month, almost six weeks, to watch what Major League Baseball is doing, to learn from their already made mistakes, and correct them. One of those major mistakes and one of the biggest questions of if, the major, if Major League Baseball can continue their season – was that you had the Marlins already with three positive tests in, in the morning, the, uh, the morning before a game, just hours before the game, still took the field and played against the Phillies last Sunday. And as we saw, the outbreak continued with the Marlins. More players got sick. And thankfully for baseball, they were lucky because the spread didn't go over to the Phillies. Baseball is a socially distant sport enough to where even though the, some players were sick and didn't know it, they were asymptomatic, the tests didn't come back yet. That showed they were positive. 
because baseball is socially distant, the Phillies weren't affected. The NFL can't take that risk. And as we see, one of the major errors by Major League Baseball is not being clear on the protocol of what, mean, what, what it takes to play and what it takes to not play and forfeit the game. Major League Baseball was unprepared. They did not have in their 113-page manual, did not have an outline, did not have a guideline or a protocol to say, hey, if there's a certain number of tests hours before the game, you can't play. So despite the Marlins having four players test positive, they still played on Sunday. The NFL easily can learn from this, and more importantly, take the decision out of the hands of the players, take the decision out of the hands of the coaches, the general manager, and really the organization. This has to be from the top of Roger Goodell decision. What is an outbreak? What determines to be an outbreak? And what's the number we can't have a game played? Because as we saw, I mean, you have a group chat with the Marlins saying we want to play. If you leave it to the teams, the competitive juices will flow, the competitive spirit will show, and they won't forfeit. They won't, I don't think, a team will sacrifice themselves for the good of the league. Now we have four positive tests, guys, you know, we'll probably have more. We're just going to take, we're going to set this one out. We're going to take the, the cautious route and say, you know what, we're not going to play this, we'll take the L. The league has to put in a policy. Learn from Major League Baseball, who was not prepared for, a, for an outbreak, and put a policy in place where it comes from the top of what constitutes an outbreak or not and wh- what it takes for a team to forfeit or not. Because as we see, Major League Baseball can get away with having some players sick and still playing a game. The NFL cannot. That is the last thing the NFL needs. So you got to make sure those players on the field are 100% clean, coronavirus-free, or the league's going to have a tough time getting off the floor. We're starting to see, I don't want to call it a trend, but now we're really starting to see players actually decide their future well-being, their future status, and college players are slowly starting to opt out of the 2020 season. We've seen three big names so far. Rashad Bateman, a receiver at Minnesota, Caleb Farley, cornerback at Virginia Tech, both first-round talents. And now the latest one. So far, the biggest name, the biggest domino to drop, is in my alma mater, Penn State, their linebacker, Micah Parsons, also is rumored, I should say. Hey, he hasn't officially said it himself. But Eric Edholm over at Yahoo does a great job with their draft coverage. So according to his sources, Micah Parsons was going to opt out of the 2020 season. So that's by far the biggest name that could opt out that could not play. And obviously, this is all in preparation to save themselves because it's going to be a weird year trying to get ready for the NFL draft in 2021. So the question is now, especially with a big name coming out, you think maybe that makes it easier for a lot of other players. If a big name is going to opt out, okay, I'll do it too. Will this be a trend? Are we going to see more and more and more of this to where you know, every, every team, let's say, in the Power Five is going to be without their best player? Or a team like Alabama are going to be decimated because four, five, six players are going to opt out and not play. I'm going to say no. This is not going to be a trend. We'll see a few more players. Don't get me wrong. This is not going to be some sort of trend. This is not going to be some sort of mass exodus to where every college football player with talent and skill that's draft eligible is going to leave. I don't think so. Because first of all, you got to look at the criteria. Only surefire, really, first-round picks are going to be the ones that should consider opting out. So what, what, what should we say? That's about 20 players maybe? And we think are locks in the first round, no matter what, if they don't play another game, if they don't play another snap? Michael Parsons, I mean, he's a borderline top five pick. I understand he's a linebacker, but he is that good. And he's gotten that many great reviews already from scouts. That he is surefire going to be, if not maybe top five, top ten. Rashad Bateman, a big, physical, talented wide receiver from Minnesota. And Caleb Farley, a great corner at Virginia Tech. All three are going in the first round. They didn't need a 2020 season to add more tape to cement their status. They're already in. So really, what are we talking about? About 20 players? We're talking about the Trevor Lawrences of the world, the Justin Fields of the world. To me, I think this is going to be a great year and a great example for a lot of these players that are maybe late first-round picks, early second-round picks, or even later on picks, to improve their draft, uh, draft stock. This is a chance for them to put on tape, to show out, and really give scouts a second thought of like, well, okay, this guy's pretty good. Maybe we should think about taking him higher. Because let's think about the uncertainty for a second here. 
as we know, we don't even know what a 2020 season is going to look like if a 2020 season could be finished in college football or in the NFL, either or. They're going to start. We know that for sure. We know the NFL is going to start. We know college football is going to start. We don't know what it's going to look like, if it's going to finish, how it's going to finish. But let's think about this for a second. What if the virus continues through 2020? It's still around 2021. We don't have a vaccine or we don't have a vaccine that works effectively just yet. And there's no guarantee right now that the scouting combine is going to happen in February. And there's no guarantee that even pro days at these schools could happen. Because scouts aren't allowed to travel. That really hurts the scouting process in the offseason. A lot of the work done by these teams and by these organizations are done from February to April. Or January to April, I should say. So there's no even guarantee that a scouting combine could happen, that a pro day could happen. In theory, this could be the last time, if players opt out, this could be the last time that they have any sort, or there's no other way, excuse me, there's no other way for these teams to evaluate them anymore. You could send teams tapes, you could send teams videos, it's not the same as being there in person, timing yourself, measuring the player yourself, interviewing the player, trying to get his mental makeup, so there's no guarantee that any of that will be around in February and March and April to show the scouts that, sure, I didn't play in 2020, but look what I've been working on in the offseason. Look how in shape I am. Look how big I am. Look how fast I am. So if that's, if that's not a guarantee, it's a major risk. If, again, if you're someone not of the elite of the elite, if you're not a Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields, if you're not a Micah Parsons, just sit down and basically say, I, there's nothing else I could do to improve my draft stock. This is what I am. And hopefully, you know, next year you'll draft me. But two, I think players can really help their stock more than hurt. And I have a great example, and it's very recent. Last year, LSU. They had one, two, three, five players drafted in the first round last year. Obviously, they have that great year in 2019, going to feed win the national title. Joe Burrow lights the world on fire. The offense is unstoppable. You know, we, we all know. But whether it's Joe Burrow... Where it's Caleb on Chase on, where it's Justin Jefferson, Patrick Queen, Clyde Edwards Alaire. All different positions. All first round picks. All five of them. And you know what they have in common? Not only that they went to LSU, obviously, in first round picks, they all have in common that they were not first round picks before the season started. None of them were slated to go anywhere near the first round before the twenty nineteen season started. And what happened? They played their way into it. Joe Burrow played his way from a late round pick into the first pick of the draft. Justin Jefferson played his way from an under, underrated recruit to a first-round pick. Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Think about this. In a, in, a, in a league where the running back position is so marginalized, such an afterthought, such a position where it's basically plug-and-play. We'll take anyone from the fifth round, cheap labor, we'll plug him in, and he'll run for 1,000 yards. She spent a first-round pick on this guy. He is that talented. He is that good. All because in 2019, they showed out and put on tape, this is a can't-miss prospect. That's what to me, despite you know some of these big names already coming out, like in all three players that opted out so far, Michael Parsons, Rashad Bateman, Caleb Farley, all first-round picks. I do think it, make, it makes it easier for you to opt out when you see big names opting out. Right? If, if Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields decide to play this year, I personally do think you know, there's a little bit more peer pressure to say, you know, I, I think it makes it harder for players to opt out. I do. Because if these talented players, if these surefire top five picks are playing, what makes you think you can just opt out and say, you know what, I've done enough, I'm good. My body work speaks for itself. I think there's a major chance that a lot of these players could end up like LSU last year. Five in the first round, neither of the five, n- any of the five. We're slated to be first round picks before the season started. So that's why I don't think we'll see a mass exit. I, I don't think that this is going to be a, a major number of players opting out, a lot of talent leaving college football this year. 